invite you to join us for the morning worship service of Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church. We welcome you as we worship the Lord together. And welcome home. Everybody comfortable? That's too bad. We can raise the heat a little bit and make it feel more comfortable. Uh, camp meeting if you want us to. But no, good. Good that you're here. Some of you are guests today. This is your first time at Trinity on the Hill. Please know you are welcome. We're glad that you chose this place to be today to worship Christ. Um, if you would, please follow the good example of our members and sign in on the welcome folder. You'll find that on your pew. And if you have any questions about what we do around here, we'd be glad to answer those questions. But the task at hand is to worship Christ. Do you need to feel that presence today? Do you need that love of Christ to be so evident that as you leave this place, you can be the witness that you need to be for a world out there that needs to hear it? Let's worship that Christ. As our call to worship, we're going to start off singing. And we're going to sing a song called Standing on the Promises. All the words are in your bulletin, and you have to sing Standing on the Promises, Standing. And then if you get tired, we're going to go to the second song, which is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. So you can lean on your neighbor. But let's go ahead and stand and join us with Standing on the Promises. Good singing. You can have a seat. That'll be good. We're, we're taking uh, our future in our hands, and pretty soon we're going to be up there with the land with Christ as, as Christians. So we're going to be looking forward to that sweet by and by. See 
singing. Y'all sound great out there. Important thing to remember about us is we sound better when you sing louder. <laughs> so important for you to sing real good. Now we're going to come to that time in the worship service where we want to kind of just pause and reflect on the, the week and, and the day and where our lives are going. Uh, this altar will be open as we get ready for our prayer time. And the important song that we're singing is what a friend we have in Jesus and how important it is to come to him with our burdens and our problems and our cares. So your, your words are in the bulletin. Please join us and come down to the altar as you will or make your pew your own altar. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We want to thank you this morning for your amazing grace that saved us, that changed our lives and gives us hope for today and the days to come. Amid the hope that we have, however, we live in a world filled with tremendous challenge, a world that is marred by sin, a world in which we sometimes feel overwhelmed because we look around and we see all the problems and the needs and we wonder, is there any hope? Is there anything that I can do? And others say, I just don't know what this world is coming to. Lord, when we contemplate the events of this past week, our hearts and minds are troubled. We see the events in Charlottesville and Barcelona and other places, and we see the hatred that some people have in their hearts for others, and we know that this is not your desire. It is evil, pure and simple. 
It is hard for us to comprehend how someone could have that much hatred in their heart. Yet even today, we know that others are planning for other acts of violence and hatred. So what can we do as we do not have complete control over the events in our world? We can remain hopeful. We can choose to love others. We can choose to focus on the good things in life. In the Old Testament book of Micah, there is a question that is posed to the nation of Israel, and the question is this, what does the Lord require of you? And the response is to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. We can still do that today. We can share the good news of Christ, which is ultimately what will lead to changed hearts and minds. And we can pray. We can pray for one another. Today we pray for our president and vice president and senators and congressmen and other government leaders who are attempting to lead and make decisions during these difficult situations. They need your wisdom and guidance. Lord, today we pray for the police officers who serve all over this country in very difficult circumstances. We pray that you place a hedge of protection around them as they deal with tremendous stress each day. We pray that you would be with their family members as they watch their loved ones walk out the door each day, not knowing what that day will bring, how stressful that can be. We pray this morning for those serving in the military. Many of them are away from home, and it can be lonely. Many of them are serving in very dangerous situations, risking their lives to protect us so that we may worship you today in freedom. Lord, may you bless them today. May you place people in their lives and remind them that they are not forgotten. We pray for our school teachers who are not only attempting to teach, but many of them are having to deal with children who come from a very difficult home life. We pray for those who will be involved in just a few short weeks in the release time education program this year. Help them as they serve you by serving others and for many of the children that they will encounter, they will be the only, only person who they've ever met who has shared with them the Bible and shared with them about the love of Christ. And Lord, this morning we also want to pray for children who attend schools, who go to school in fear because they're being bullied. They stand out for some reason. They're a little bit different, and so others tend to pick on them. And Lord, we pray that you would give them strength. We pray that our church would be the church that you want us to be. We pray for Mike as he brings today's message. Lord, we pray that you give him wisdom and guidance as he continues to lead this congregation. We thank you for him and for Connie and for their service, for the other members of the staff, for the church leaders, for those who are here this morning. Lord, may our time today be a time of encouragement. May all that we do today be pleasing to you as we lift up the one who gave his life for us on a cross and rose again on the third day. It's in his name we pray this morning. One of the beauties of coming down to the altar is when you walk up, when you wake up and walk up and walk out, you're supposed to have your burdens released. So you're supposed to lay them at the altar and not carry them back to your seat or to your home. So let's, that's because there's power in the blood to relieve us from that burden of sin. So let's all stand up and we're going to be excited about singing There's Power in the Blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Cause you are evil and victory win. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. There is power.
sing that again, a cappella. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. Before you get seated, and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Many of it in Matthew's uh, Matthew's Gospel, Jesus talked about not storing up your treasures here on this earth where thieves can come in and moths can destroy and, and all of that, but put your treasures in heaven where it will not be destroyed and it will be beneficial to all. In that mind and in that thinking today, we pray that you understand the love of Christ is something that is constant and forever wherever you are. God bless you. Here's your wave. See you. All right. Did you like that toe-tapping music? Oh, that was great. We have a little guy in the uh, balcony in the 830 service. Not only was his toes tapping, his whole body was tapping. It was great to see and wonderful. Today we're going to talk about the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the building that we're in now. And why is this building special? Because God made it. God is here with us. Now, in the Bible, the sanctuaries are most of the time called temples. Have you ever heard that word, temples? That God is in his holy temple, and so people came to temple or came to church to see God. So this is a very special place, isn't it? It's a place that we treat with tender kindness. We make it always beautiful. We always... Um, respect it. Is that what you were taught about sanctuaries and temples, right? Am I, am I in the right direction on this? Help me out. Okay, I got a head nod. Well, I got a shocker for you. Guess what? Your body is a sanctuary of God. <gasps> hmm. In the Bible, and we're going to read that today to your parents, in the Bible, it says that your body is a temple of God, a sanctuary of God, because God lives with you. And wherever you go, there goes the sanctuary of God. I think the lesson that they were trying to teach us is that since God lives in our bodies and treating it like a sanctuary is that we must respect it and always be kind to our bodies. So there's going to be some important lessons coming out of that as you continue to grow older. So remember that lesson today. Not only do we meet in the sanctuary, but our bodies are sanctuaries where God lives with us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for being with us wherever we are. That you gave us these beautiful bodies and you said that you would live with us. And so our bodies become like a sanctuary where we can meet with you. But help us to treat these bodies with tenderness and respect and holiness. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. And all God's kids said, Amen. Miss Lillian is going to be guiding you to Children's Church this morning. And Children's Church is going all the way up to the fifth grade if you want to go there. Or you can be returning to sit with your families in the pews. So families, if they're coming back to you, make sure you raise your hand so they can find who you are. As we come down to our time of offering, I want to just have a little private, uh, a special privilege moment to introduce to you one of our mission partners uh, who is in mission in India. Uh, Dr. Prabhu Singh has been a part of our mission uh, outreach for over a decade now. We started with him when he was in seminary at Asbury Theological Seminary, and he has uh, now gone back to India, been there for uh, about 10 years, and doing a wonderful job in the teaching of missions to those. So, uh, Reverend Dr. Prabhu Singh, thank you for being with us and joining with us. Applause. 
Since we get to talk about our mission outreach partners, coming up this week, actually starting today, is the children's consignment sale. It's a big portion of our mission support, uh, nationally, internationally, as well as locally. And if you're looking for a place to serve, if you're looking for a place to offer your gifts of talents and abilities and time, the Children's Outreach Program has a place for you. They even have a place for somebody like me. Now, I've been very careful over the last five years to find the perfect job for me. I do nothing. <laughs> but I, I'm there. But I do nothing well. Is that right? And so nobody can have that position. It's mine. Uh, Bill Jones and I have that uh, same job together. You know which job I'm talking about, Bill. We just sit over in the corner and, and watch things happen. And, uh, but there are places for anyone and everyone to serve all through the week, especially Friday and Saturday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So we do need your time. Uh, that thing does not work unless we have volunteer servants there. So go on the website, uh, see Julia, call the church, and talk to Jess Anderson. We will find a place for you to serve. All that profits goes to serve our mission outreach. None of it stays inside the church. So with that in mind, ushers, come forward that we might offer our gifts and our lives to the advancement of Christ's kingdom. Let us pray. Holy Lord in heaven, may we be as generous as you have been generous with us. May our gifts to you be a small part of how much we love you. Receive these gifts and use them for your kingdom here on earth. Amen.
makes me so happy. Just love that. And we're so glad to have Sally Shuford, who grew up here at Trinity, to, to join them on the fiddle. I don't think um, you played here before, right? This is your debut with this group here. And uh, we love having you. It really adds just that special touch. Van Haywood is kind of the daddy of this group, and he pulls them all together and works with them. And we are so blessed. Let's thank them one more time. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll Fly Away is probably one of the most iconic Southern gospel songs. I mean, who doesn't know it if you've lived in the United States? Uh, many Nashville groups have recorded it many different ways. Uh, Craig Courtney, who is one of our favorite arrangers and composers, uh, broke out of his usual mode and did a fantastic arrangement of I'll Fly Away. It's for four hands on the piano. So we got the four hands over here. Uh, and they just tear it up, I'm telling you, it's wonderful. It's kind of a combination of Scott Joplin and Gershwin. You're gonna love it. What's more fun than singing with them is to be at practice on Wednesday night when they're doing this. This is great. I'm, I may not get through the sermon today because of that, but that's okay, too. It's, 
I'm not real comfortable with the subject matter, so if I get choked up, I'll just quit, I'll just quit talking. <laughs> Camp meeting, it's when we have toe-tapping music and great gospel preaching. And you're asking the question, why are you preaching on sexuality here? Well, August is a time in which our parents get our school, our students prepared for school. And we thought this would be a great opportunity to help our parents talk about some of the issues that you might have along the way. And so we talked very early on about raising spiritual kids last week. We talked about peer pressure. I want you to know that these white shoes are the results of five years of peer pressure from Danny about me wearing white shoes during camp meeting. So I special ordered these. I am now officially broken. So <laughs> I'm wearing my white buck, so that is good. So another part of that subject, of course, raising G-rated kids in an X-rated world has to do with sexuality. Our scripture this morning, I better get my Bible for that, comes from Genesis and 1 Corinthians. The one from Genesis, of course, is very familiar to you. And probably the one from 1 Corinthians, the first part will sound familiar, but then you forgot that he was actually talking about sexuality when he was uh, writing those verses. So uh, let us stand as we honor the reading of God's holy word, uh, first from Genesis chapter 1, where God said, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then to the New Testament, uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, uh, one of his most difficult churches that he had to deal with. Uh, verse 12 of chapter 6, People say, I have the right to do anything. Doesn't that sound familiar? I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will destroy them both. However, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Well, never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Honor God with your bodies. Let us trust the Holy Spirit to awaken our curiosity, to inspire our understanding, and to change our behavior in the reading of this holy word. You may be seated. Genesis commands it, Song of Songs celebrates it, Jesus consecrates it. What is it? It's human sexuality. It is God's good gift. In Genesis chapter 1 it says, be fruitful and multiply. And along with the command, God gives the human body the strongest biological plumbing and nervous system to guarantee that we will multiply. But that's become a problem for some of us. Genesis 2 continues that affirmation of sexuality in the second creation story where he says a man and a woman were, were naked and they had no shame. It was a good gift. What happened? Genesis chapter 3 happened. The fall, sin, disobedience, everything gets distorted and twisted. Relationships, the earth itself, and indeed the gift that God had given us, human sexuality, becomes out of balance and even malignant. 
But even with that distorted view of human sexuality in the book, Song of Songs, it is celebrated. Are you familiar with the, the Old Testament book, Song of Songs? Uh, when I was growing up, it was called Song of Solomon. That's the King James Version way of saying it. When I was a little uh, high school student, uh, walking deeper in Christ, I was trying to read through the Bible, Genesis through Revelation. And I was, there were some difficult parts there in the first part of Old Testament that, you know, a, a, a teenage boy trying to resist uh, sexual temptations. Uh, I read through them quickly, got through it. Then I get to the Song of Songs. Good Lord, in the first chapter, verse 1, it says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. I closed the book and I said, I can't read that. <laughs> I did read it later. Uh, one of my biblical scholars tried to convince me that it was a book that compared uh, love of Christ and the love of the church for Christ. And I said, no, that's not what it sounds like to me. It's a celebration of God's gift of human sexuality, of romance and that. We get to the New Testament, and right off the bat, Jesus consecrates and blesses human sexuality in marriage. His first miracle is turning water into wine at a wedding. In the 19th chapter of Matthew, he'll take a lot of time with some of the uh, Pharisees talking about marriage, how a man and, shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they shall become two. He then he talks about what destroys those two with sexual immorality. And if you have any doubts about what he's thinking about it, look at his teachings on the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7. And there he says, you think it's wrong to commit adultery. I tell you, if you just look at someone with lust, you've committed adultery. He was serious about it. But in the history of the church, sometimes we, we don't want to talk about it. And in fact, if you are one of those who have only read the King James Version, don't raise your hand, but if you've only read the King James Version, you have never seen the word sex or sexuality in Scripture. It's just not there. Now, in the more modern translations, we name the name. And the church's position on this sometimes is see no evil, hear no evil, and say nothing. And we've not helped parents or our children. The church has seemed to make more problems for parents than helping them. Because in the early days of the church, like Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, they were, uh, some of them were Jewish people who then converted to Christianity, but the most, uh, most of them were Greeks and Romans who were worshiping in pagan temples where sexuality was actually a part of the worship service. It was a part of your um, spirituality, if you will. Can you imagine if the modern church gets a hold of that as a marketing scheme? Oh, we'll be in trouble. <laughs> it's starting to tick now, right? And so no wonder that some of the early church fathers that we like to quote sometimes, like Augustine, uh, who battled uh, sexual control his whole life, uh, one day in misery simply said or wrote that it was probably a mistake that God created sex in the first place. Jerome even went further. He said, any husband who is too passionate a lover with his own wife is himself an adulterer. What twisted understanding the church has come through. And sometimes it's not the church, sometimes it's the parents. I know as a youth pastor, as well, let me start back. As a teenager, I remember when uh, the youth group was going to talk about sexuality, we had to send permission slips home to the parents so that we could talk about it. Oh, they just raised a big fuss. As a youth pastor, same thing happened. I've seen it happen all the time. You can see that parents are sometimes confused about what it is that we need to teach about sexuality. We need to teach, though, that it is a gift from God. I like the way N.T. Wright, he's our contemporary theologian. He uh, was a bishop of the Anglican Church before he retired. He says we need to remind ourselves that the entire biblical sexual ethic is deeply counterintuitive to our culture. That what we are saying now about historical, traditional, ethical teaching is counter to our culture. And so all human beings, some of the time, some human beings all the time, have this deep, heartfelt longing for some kind of sexual gratification that does not reflect our Creator's intentions for His creation. And so sexual restraint is thrown out the door, but for Christians, sexual restraint is mandatory for all. And it's difficult for most 
And for some, it's extremely challenging, but it doesn't change our creational standards. And so when we talk about what it means that human sexuality is a good gift, especially as we talk about raising G-rated kids, God-rated kids in an X-rated world, we get down to that thing that we call the talk. You know what I'm talking about? The talk. If I took a survey on what my parents told me about sexuality, I'm sure that most of you would say nothing. <laughs> but as parents, we need to be the ones who shape and influence the way our children think. We can't subcontract that to the schools or even to the church, really, although the church needs to help you. I think uh, that's why sex education got started in the school system, because my parents didn't want to talk about it. So, yeah, let the school talk about it. Oh, that would be good. Now, what about their parents? How did they talk to my parents about that? Well, they didn't have to because it, they were on the farm. They saw it every week, and you talked about it. It was natural. But my parents didn't live on the farm, and they didn't know how to talk about it. So we let the schools take care of it. Connie and I had a conversation about this part of the sermon, so I wouldn't misquote her on this one. And uh, she said that her sex, her sex talk from her mother was, one day she came up and gave her a book and said, read this. That's all. In my case, it was a question. Is there anything you need to know? <laughs> I think it was about a week before I got married. I'm not sure. But <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, that's funny. Uh, but what about you and Connie? How did you do as parents in the talk? Well, our oldest is, was the boy, so I got to go first with that since I was the male in the family, and although Connie did fill in some other stuff about behavior and stuff. And I noticed that he was starting, uh, starting to take more interest in girls than kayaking. Uh, that's what clued me up, you know. Don't, he's not going on a kayaking trip because he wants to go with the youth group somewhere to be with and just fill in the blank. So I thought, well, it's time. It's time to talk. Uh, the first thing we cleared out of the way was the mechanical stuff. I discovered that the school had taught that very well. He knew all the mechanical parts of it. So we then moved, we moved to the second part, which was respect. And I talked to him about the fact he needed to respect the girl, and he needed to respect the girl's parents, and that he needed to respect the girl's relationship with God. Seriously, that's what I said. I wanted him to understand that his respect of this girl was an eternal. It was a holy thing. And I think he began to understand that. So with that very skillful handling of relationships and sex, my parting words were this. Just keep it in your pants. <laughs> At all times... No exceptions. That was my speech. I did elaborate. I said, you do not have my permission. Take it out of your pants. You do not have your mother's permission. Oh, this is, you, you blushed on this one. You do not have your mother's permission. Take it out of your pants. So he went off to college. And I would email him often. You know, this was when emails were starting to be popular. It was, it was the, you know, cool thing. You're supposed to get an email back, but I never did, except when he was short of money. But anyway, that's another subject. So I would always end my email with this sign-off. Study hard, have fun, be a gentleman. And he understood exactly what I meant when I said be a gentleman. I was referring to his respect for girls that he would date. He knew that. Every single email. Now our second born was a girl. So Connie gets to have that talk. And they talked on a regular basis, as is the uh, common practice for uh, females. Connie had this neat way of doing it, though. She would always do the conversation in the car. 
That way, Leanne didn't feel embarrassed by her looking at her as they talked. And Leanne just spilled her guts on all this. And so that's the way they had the conversation. Uh, one particular incident that Connie remembers is during that particular time in political history when there was a certain presidential um, intern and they were having a little trouble there. And that word of trouble was all over the news. I mean, they could not stop saying that word. Of course, you're in the car and you got the radio on. And Leanne wanted to know what that certain phrase was. And Connie said, no, you probably don't want to know. But Leanne insisted. She's in the fourth, fifth grade, something like that. So Connie began describing it. And Leanne said, nope, I don't want to hear anything else. <laughs> You know, age appropriate is what you have to understand there. We're going to talk a little bit about age appropriate. The talk. It really shouldn't be a talk. It should be a conversation. It should be more than one. You can't do one and done on this one, folks. It's got to be a conversation. One, hopefully, that you begin earlier in their lives when you're only talking about body parts. This is a hand, and that's the foot, and so on and so forth. And as that conversation builds throughout their lives, that conversation will go deeper as well. Now, I know that our school system at that particular time was handling the, the job mechanically well, so I wanted to make sure I emphasized the relational and the godly parts of the human sexuality conversation. And especially to emphasize that this is a God talk or a God conversation. Because unless we bring God into it, we're going to be stuck between two extremes that are not good. One on one extreme is the culture's distorted indulgence of human sexuality that just knows no bounds. And on the other end is the idea that the church considers sexuality evil. It's a bad thing. And we don't want that to happen. So we, we have to bring that into the conversation ourselves. C.S. Lewis helps a lot in understanding this. He wrote, and this was back in the 40s when he wrote it, people assume that Christianity has nothing to offer to the discussion of human sexuality. In fact, people assume that Christianity hates sexuality and that religion is antithetical to one's sexual appetite. Nothing could be further from the truth. Christianity is almost the only one of the great religions which thoroughly approves of the body which was God's gift to us, which believes that matter, physicalness, is good, that God himself once took on a human body. And that same kind of body, or some kind of body, is going to be given to us as a part of eternity and be a part of eternal happiness. So what do you do in this conversations. I'm going to throw out a bunch of subjects that I think that the scriptures actually pertain to. There's lots more to this conversation. Like I said, it should be more than just one talk, but here it is. I'm giving it in one talk, so I'm going to give it rapidly. That way you won't see me blushing up here as we talk about some of these issues. The first issue is self-image, and this is one that you can start very young because children very naturally ask, who am I? And sometimes they just want to know, where did they come from? Like, did I come from Illinois or did I come from Georgia, right? And so as they ask that question, who am I, we can provide that answer. Because the culture now is telling our kids, well, you can be anything you want to be. That's a new dimension of the sexuality conversation, that we have to talk about gender clarity and gender confusion. The culture gets the, a lot of attention to this because their philosophy is, you're the only one that matters. Your self is first. And tolerance and acceptance of anything is the key philosophy of life. But the Christian faith says God created us male and female. A complementary pairing that serves the purpose of fulfilling that command to be fruitful, as well as, in Genesis chapter 2, an opportunity for helpmates to work together in the world. Yes, there is such a thing as gender dysphoria or di gender confusion. It is much more rare than they would have us believe. But in any sense of the matter, we're all confused in some way. We know that we are not the way God created us to be. We all have desires that do not honor God. And so we work through repentance and work our ways toward God's original idea. And so self-image is a very important subject. Purity. 
is an important subject to talk about. Don't wait until they're dating to start talking about purity. Talk as a young uh, preschooler about the purity of thought, about how purity of kindness and love to other people that you don't understand or that are different from you. Start talking about purity and other subjects so that when it comes time to talk about human sexuality, you introduce the word purity, they're already used to it, and it becomes a part of their vocabulary, vocabulary as well. Another topic is modesty. Now, this is one in which we always push on the girls because the girls, we tell them you can't dress uh, that way. Why? Because the boys will go ape and we can't control those boys. You know how that is. Well, it, it goes deeper than that. First Timothy chapter 2, Paul tells the women to dress modestly in church with decency and propriety. Why in the world did he mention that? Remember that this is the culture that uses sexuality in their worship practices when they're worshiping the idols and pagan gods. And when they've transferred over to Christianity, it took a while for them to understand, this isn't like down the street. We need to change. I find it interesting that in that verse 9, verse 8 talks about the men. Men, when you lift up your holy hands to pray, don't do it in anger and in arguing. My goodness, what was going on that Paul had to correct the way they, the men were praying? I mean, men, what is that all about? So yes, girls need to hear the talk of modesty and how they dress. I think that's important. But the boys are not exempt. They don't get amnesty from the responsibility of how they dress. Now, it's not a matter of their clothing that I'm talking about, their, the dress code, but it's their attitude about how they perceive and see girls the opposite sex for me the word blushing would be the word i would use instead of modesty we need to encourage our young boys to blush the prophet jeremiah condemned the people of israel men women and children both because they had forgotten how to blush they refused to blush with shame we need to teach our boys not to view girls as objects. That's a part of their modesty, I believe. And then we need to talk about boundaries and temptations. Now, we've talked about boundaries before, that we give those to our children so they don't fall over cliffs. Uh, you know, every once in a while they'll jump over those guardrails and, and explore the cliffs anyway, but at least we've slowed them down a little bit for them to consider the fact there are boundaries. Now, boundaries work best in a family, under the following three. Number one, they're well explained. Why? They're boundaries. Number two, the whole family follows those boundaries. And three, that they're not hyper-restrictive. Boundaries, guardrails, allow a kid to focus their intention on more important areas of growth rather than being worried about where the cliffs are on either side of the path. A teenager, as we said last week, under peer pressure, always doesn't think about the consequences of their actions. These boundaries help them slow down just enough maybe to think about it. And then there's temptation. Temptation will come. Temptation doesn't stop when you're a teenager either. It comes to all of us. And no temptation will come that isn't already common to the rest of humanity. That's in the scripture. I did not believe that as a teenager. I believe that I was being tempted in human sexuality in ways that no one in the rest of the world, the history of the world, had ever been that way. I found that to be false. Uh, but probably not soon enough. Nobody told me. And so we need to let people, our kids know that temptations will come to all. And when we fail at that temptation, there's going to be a sense of shame. And what do we humans do with shame? We hide it. We go crawling in the dark. But if we're having conversations with our children and they know that we're okay to talk to, they won't crawl into the darkness. They'll bring their shame to you and say, what's going on here? If you've been transparent about temptations that you've gone through in life, you don't have to give all the gory details, but let them know that you've done that, you've gone through that too. The opportunity is for them to understand that each time we uh, fail at a temptation, it's a time to learn how to Correct it later on. Another subject that my parents didn't talk to me much about is pornography. Because in my day, you actually had to show up in human form to purchase it or to get it. Nowadays, it comes to you anonymously through the internet. Kids as young as 9 and 10 years old are finding this 
on whatever uh, devices are laying around in their schools, their friends' homes, or whatever. And this anonymous aspect of pornography has made pornography go ballistic. And if we don't try to teach our children the harm that this creates, we are going to be behind. And it's not just for boys. Just read a testimony uh, about a month, two months ago. I saved it so I could use it in this message. It's a testimony by Kate Warren. Kate is the wife of the Reverend Rick Warren, famous for his Purpose Driven Life books. She testified that at a young age, she went to a neighbor's house to babysit. And there she was exposed to pornography. Not the parents didn't make her do it, she just found it. And she went home full of shame and guilt, never said a word to her parents. Her parents were preachers, so she couldn't, or she didn't feel like she could. She felt like she would never do it again until she went to babysit again for that family. And she made sure she looked it up again. She struggled with that throughout her teenage years, even causing trouble in her early marriage with Rick Warren. It's not just for the boys. Uh, abstinence is something that we need to also talk to our children about. Uh, abstinence is not just a way to not get pregnant. It's a way to honor God. We honor God by obeying his principles of the sanctity of sex within the marriage covenant of man and woman. It also is a way to honor the one that we marry. Sexual purity is that gift that only the partner can bring to that marriage covenant. I like what Philip Yancey writes in his book, What Are We Missing? He said, the rules, are not that, the rules that we make are not there to spoil all of our sexual adventures, but rather as guidelines protecting something of great value that can only be realized in an exclusive covenant relationship. And then as we talk about to our children, what is marriage? And in, since 2015 in America, that's become even a more difficult conversation since same gender marriage is now legal in the United States. We need to be the one teaching our children not only a biblical view, but a historical view of what it means to be married man and wife together. We are the ones who need to be teaching that. And we also need to be teaching the, the kindness of thought and behavior to those who might even be related to us, who might be our friends or neighbors next door, or at least the family of the, our kids' friends who might be in a same gendered marriage, that we can teach our children that this is different, but you can be kind. I mean, that's what we're dealing with in racism, isn't it? We have these uh, white supremacists who thinks that hatred and, and violence is the answer, and we know that it's not. We need to talk about singleness. Paul was the, the premier uh, author on singleness, himself not being married. And as we talk with our children through their young adult ages, we give them a chance to talk back to us. But no matter how much you talk, how much you listen, because a conversation includes listening, right? Sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes things go off the path. We jump the guardrails. And tragic mistakes happen. What happens then is that the communication door is already open and the possibility of redemption increases. We need to understand that this is the way Jesus operated in a world that was confused about its sexual practices, especially when he was so open and forgiving with people caught in sexual sin, especially females because they were victims in that. Luke chapter 7, where the simple woman is anointing his feet and the Pharisees get upset. If you knew what kind of woman that was, you wouldn't let her do that. And Jesus looked at her as he talked to the Pharisee and said, she's been forgiven a lot. And that's because she loves a lot. If we can forgive our children, they will learn to love as well. And so we have to understand that second chances are given. Repentance is a part of that, sure, but second chances. Now, before I finish, I want to give you three resources that I'm very uh, ex excited about offering to you. Uh, if you're an adult who is still dealing with uh, human sexuality and, and, and its place in faith and the world, I would challenge you to read C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. This is the one I referred to earlier. It's based on the lectures he gave over the radio 
to calm down uh, all of England during the Second World War, and they were being bombed. Uh, why he would choose to talk about sexuality during that time, I don't know, but it's part of uh, that book. It's section three, chapters five and six. Uh, if you don't have his book, you can Google um, C.S. Lewis on sexuality, and um, usually there's a couple of authors that are uh, following his chapters there. So if you're an adult dealing with that, the reason I say that is because he deals with it on a philosophical level. Perhaps at this point in time, you're not, you're not trusting the, the scriptural uh, and church traditions, but he deals with it in a philosophical way. For parents who want to or need to or are in the midst of having the talk, the conversation, I would recommend uh, a series called The Christ-Centered Parenting. This is written by Russell Moore. Uh, from the Baptist Ethics and Religion Liberty Commission. You can get this at Lifeway Store, but Lillian has this resource in her office, and we're trying to, to get it ready to be used by groups in our church who want to talk about this, or individuals for that matter. Here's the reason I like the book. Not, I like the content, but after each section, I think there's five sections, and it deals with everything from technology to end of life and uh, sanctity of life and things like that. There are five different sections to have those conversations with your children at five different ages. Preschool, elementary, preteen, middle school, I don't know the difference in those two, high school, and even young adult. It gives you uh, the big idea, key scriptures, key questions for that age, what that age is dealing with, developmental milestones, coaching tips, conversation starters, what to pray for when you finish that conversation. I, I've never quite seen it put out just like that in one little resource. So Lillian has that, and you're hope, hopefully you'll see some of that. Now, here's some really big news uh, that we're rolling out uh, today, and we're going to finish rolling it out next week. Trinity on the Hill now has membership for all of our people in rightnowmedia.org. To explain it in a nutshell, think Christian Netflix. Does that help? Some of you who don't do Netflix, you're like, what? It's not on Comcast, it's on Netflix. I can say that because we're past noon. <laughs> Some of you will get that. Um, all right, where was I? Oh, yes, this is called Right Now Media. We are paying for the membership so all of you can download over 20,000 videos and training films that has everything to do with Bible studies, family life, marriage, sexuality, Ch uh, raising children, uh, church growth, church leadership. So in the middle of the night when you are up against it and you don't know which way to go, and it's 1 a.m., you don't want to call Mike because he's asleep and he can't think after, you know, like 10 o'clock anymore, uh, then you can go on your, uh, your iPhone, your iPad, your computer, wherever it's internet connected, and you can download subjects that you can actually see and hear immediately to help you. Uh, now, we're going to be rolling that out in the next 10 days. This is a resource all of you can use, and you don't, you don't pay for it as you download it. It's already paid for by the church. I think that's a wonderful thing for us, especially for parents who are trying to have this conversation. Maybe you need to hear somebody else say how it's supposed to be said, and you can try to mimic it as you teach your children. Perhaps it's your marriage. Perhaps it's a book of the Bible that you've always been interested in knowing deeper subject about. That's where you can go and click on to it. Again, more of that next year. Human sexuality. God created it. The Bible uh, celebrates it. Jesus consecrates it. Let us treat it as the gift that it is and respect it as the gift that God has given to us. Let us pray. Holy God. This has been the worship service from Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church, a production of Trinity Methodist Television, as an outreach ministry to those of the Augusta area. If you found this to be a meaningful service, let us hear from you by calling 738-8822 or writing Trinity on the Hill 1330 Montesano Avenue, Augusta, Georgia, 30904.